Hello. Hi. Oh, yeah, the mic is working. Hi. Good morning. Wow. There's quite a crowd given um, we have daylight savings. So thank you all for uh, making the journey an hour earlier. Um, I've been really honored to, um, give the, uh, to be asked to give the keynote here at scale. And um, <coughs> first of all, um, I'd like to wish um, OSI and open source um, a happy 20th anniversary. As many of you know, it's, um, it was 20 years ago that the term open source was coined. And um, what we've been doing and what we see um, people that have been in the community for a long time doing is storytelling. So um, what I'm going to do this morning is, is storytelling and, and talk about um, some of the things we did in the early days that really helped kind of put together the building blocks to enable our success. And a lot of the things that we take for granted and um, looking at some of the popular projects and some of the key people that were involved. So, um, yeah, one of, so at 20 years on, um, you know, open source is one. That's what we're being told, right? Um, Linux is everywhere, and um, open source is also everywhere in the cloud. Um, we have one. How many people here thinks we've won? Okay, that's a lot fewer than hands than I thought. Um, so um, look at these numbers. Now, these came from the Linux Foundation. You know, 23 million, over 23 million developers, 41 billion lines of code, 64 million repos on GitHub, and um, 1,100 new projects a day. And so this is a significant amount of growth. We're also seeing that, you know, software is... Um, disrupting markets. But it's really open source that has been the biggest disruption in the software industry. Um, we didn't do it overnight. It took us 20 years or more to get here. And, you know, it's open source. It's the 20th anniversary. Free software has also been around for a lot longer than that. So um, we've got a lot of people consuming open source. And um, when I ask an audience how many people typically, um, when I ask a non-technical audience how many people here are using open source, very few hands go up because they really don't understand that behind you know, every device that they use, and everything uses open source, even the phone. So, and we're, we're going to see um, a bigger um, group of developers joining our community from companies that are consumers and um, they're not yet contributors and they want to learn um, from, kind of, from kind of what we've been doing over the years. So uh, I can see there's a lot of very um, seasoned people within this community. I know this community has been um, active for a very long time and scale has been going on for a long time as well. So, it's going to be important to tell our stories and um, not have folks um, feel that this is like, you know, just a given. This is like how it was handed to us and um, the work that went into getting to this place that we're at now. And we have, as a community, a lot of sharing to do. I know that there's been some great talks um, this week here as well and really, really packed rooms. Um, so, in the beginning, <laughs> um, I'm going to tell my story. Um, that's what's happening this morning. And, um, you know, being asked to share my story, I knew that I always wanted to travel the world and work with different cultures and learn about them. And then I did a computer science degree. And then this happened as my career. So, the various projects, uh, the companies that I worked with, and uh, some really like interesting milestones, for example, you know, getting the UK government to select a standard for um, open technologies so that all government software would, it would enable open source to work alongside other software as well. So, you know, I guess the stars have really, I feel very blessed, very aligned within my career 
that I had some of these opportunities, um, including Summer of Code, um, setting that up and running that for the first two years. And it's really taken me around the world and working with really brilliant minds in the industry. And um, as a student, I guess most kids are told, you know, you can do programming or do systems analysis. And I guess back then, that's, those were the two options. And I wanted to do both, and I wanted to do more. So it wasn't until much later, 1999, when I found open source, and that just really felt like a calling. And the journey with open source, open office, um, started um, when it was announced in 99. Um, the project, I don't know how many of you use open office or LibreOffice? Fantastic. Wow, that's pretty much the whole room. Awesome. So, um, you know, the journey started, um, the code base was seven and a half million lines of code. So, for the time, it was a really, really large code base. And um, it was interesting because the, the company that was acquired by Sun, um, Star Division, was based in Germany. So, most of the developers were German. English was not their native language. Um, they all sat next to each other, working in uh, an office where they've been, pro they've been collaboratively developing this software for 12 years. And, and we then had to um, release that code base and um, engage and build a community around that code base and evolve it as well. We had some incredible help from um, Brian Bellendorf, who is one of the Apache founders. And also, he ran a company called CollabNet. And we had, um, you know, all the things that you would expect in, say, an Apache project now with mailing lists, all the right mailing lists, dev lists, projects structured in a way that um, it was easy for newcomers to come and go and um, figure out which of the pieces that they wanted to work on. Um, and they represented the various modules that um, was available in the software. And we kind of learned from um, some of the folks that had come before us. But there weren't too many of those back in 1999 and 2000. So um, for me, um, Open Office was um, a really incredible journey. Um, after that, I went to work on the NetBeans project. And um, I had the chance to travel to China when we were releasing NetBeans 3.6, um, the localized version. And, and you'll probably recognize this gentleman on the screen, James Gosling, father of Java. And James came along on this trip to um, release a local language version and talked to kids in the university, um, talked to developers across China. And we also got to travel um, along the Great Wall, walk along the Great Wall of China together as well. At Google, um, I was fortunate enough to um, be part of the, um, well, actually, I was the only one that traveled with Vint Cerf through Germany and Austria, visiting a whole bunch of uh, universities uh, and taking long train journeys. And part of that was trying to understand what were the universities teaching kids uh, and how much open source was included in that education. Um, and along with that, Having Vint um, on the journey, we got to meet the commissioner of the European Union and um, influence at that higher level as well um, about the need for um, open source in education. You know, on a trip to Kenya, um, I spoke in Nairobi, um, working, sitting alongside um, the ICT ministers, um, minister for Kenya, and um, the audience was really a government education group. And we talked about, I talked about Google Summer of Code and how um, it was easy for students all over the world to participate in that. And um, Mark Shuttleworth was also there um, as part of uh, Canonical Ubuntu. And I got to travel back, Mark and the Canonical crew, on a private jet back to London. So, you know, some, some fun things, it wasn't all work. And here's, here's another um, opportunity where Traveling to other countries, um, and this was in 2006, so um, in the early days, really kind of helping spread 
our message to lots of different um, uh, geographies and um, individuals that were working within the community. So here we had, you know, um, my friend here, Denise Cooper, who's sitting at the front. She actually took a lot of these pictures. Um, but Jim Zemlin, who heads up the Linux Foundation, um, he was just starting up the Linux Foundation at the time. Um, Brian Bellendorf, um, uh, David Axmark from MySQL. So it kind of felt like a, now it feels like a who's who of open source. But above all of this, um, you know, we kind of travel to conferences and um, tell our stories. And when you look at the 200 or so talks here, you know, it's storytelling or teaching your craft. And that's a really, really key part of what we do. Um, it's, you know, not just the mentoring within um, projects, but it's also um, sharing, sharing what you know, sharing and collaborating. So it's an essential part of um, growing your community. And then events and conferences. Um, the Open Office community was very creative, and it was, there were community-hosted conferences in different parts of the world. The last one was in Barcelona. This one is in Copa. And again, all organized by volunteers on a very um, tight budget. Um, and, you know, it's so great to come to community conferences like this and um, see kind of the networking and um, the collaboration that goes on. So my first lesson is um, that our communities are global and um, seek out every opportunity to connect. And in connecting, you will also be recruiting for your projects as well. And that's a really important thing to do. A friend of mine um, who works at uh, AWS, um, he was at ApacheCon last year, and um, he said that we were all recruiters. And I kind of, um, I guess I kind of squirmed at that thought, but you know, later realized, no, actually, it's a big part of our job to go out and we engage with the community. And when we make that connection, um, that's when we get individuals collaborating and coming and working with us. So it's a big part of what we do. Um, the next story is about finding your tribe. How do you play? Now, um, how many here are new to open source? Wow. OK, one hand. OK, wow. So this is not the norm. And I was expecting this to be a very seasoned um, community and community of developers and contributors. So I guess for the gentleman in the back, you can come and see me afterwards. I am not going to spend too much time on actually finding your tribe. But it sounds like those of you that have been contributing for a while have actually made a connection and um, found and connected to your tribe, which is really, really key. So with Open Office as well, you know, again, very early days of open source, it was really important to make sure that the values of your community were articulated well. And um, you welcomed people that came to your community and you shared. And you actually shared not just the information, but um, you know, your craft as well. So, so here's for, um, I guess I don't need to ask the question now, how many of you have been doing this for a long time? But how many have you been doing it for more than 10 years, working in open source? OK, fantastic. Wow, that's over, still over half the room. Um, so you know, finding your tribe, I mean, tribes are in different forms. Um, some kind of, um, I know for open office, it started off mostly uh, initially, it was the German com contributors and the community already working around the code, but it didn't take long for it to spread um, globally, particularly because it was an end-user application we were developing, which mattered to many people um, because they were looking for something to run on Linux. They were looking for it to run on, on uh, operating systems that um, current um, Office productivity suites were not available in. So, and. Part of it is not just um, uh, contributing, but also for the new people in the community is um, finding your mentor. And um, you know, in Open Office, it was, and this was um, 
taken in Beijing at one of our events. But um, mentoring was very, very key early on. And you, know, you will hear this in many, many talks now, but it's really, um, the, this is the reason why the community, one of the reasons the community really grew and was successful, that we were able to um, mentor the first set of uh, folks that joined the community, and then they in turn did the same. And we kind of had this like um, huge kind of like branch of a tree um, spreading out and supporting the rest of the community that showed up. Remember, people didn't know what open source was or how to even engage at that time. I felt we did a really good job in open office. You know, I mean, Summer of Code was a really good example of how mentors can engage with developers and help um, bring people up to speed very quickly so they can be productive. And this is the um, Apache tribe. And um, I was uh, very honored to actually take this photograph um, of the giants on whose shoulders we stand. So a lot of the lessons that I've learned um, from the early days of open source have come from um, a lot of the Apache community members, um, people like Brian Bellendorf and Greg Stein. And given um, you know, so many hands were up in the audience, um, the key to success in your project is also about leadership, um, building and using your leadership skills and, and working on organizational development. And it's not just about the code that you're involved in or the key activity, but kind of looking around and looking at the whole community and even now going, um, okay, what are the communities doing that are, um, that are um, growing those communities? How can we change and improve on what we're doing. And in the early days, we did a lot of that. So there was some conversations with the GNOME Foundation, with Mozilla. We were trying to kind of also learn from each other. So mentoring, sharing, collaboration, and also um, learning are just the key. They're the key to learning and, and development. And you know, these lessons seem like, yeah, of course, duh. But really, this is, these are the lessons from the early days that have kind of come forward and enabled us to be successful in what we're doing today. So um, <coughs> this story is, um, is kind of an entertaining one. Um, I don't know how many of you remember this ad um, on TV. I, I wanted to play it, but um, you know, it's, uh, it's an Audi ad, and, and I kind of grew up with this tagline, you know, Vorsprung durch Technik. Now, um, it really stands for precision in engineering, and, um, and German engineering was kind of considered a, um, almost like, you know, what everyone else was striving to achieve. And um, so I, with the open office community and the developers, it was uh, interesting because uh, the, the developers really prided themselves in perfectionism and really building something that was going to go out and actually be perfect. So. In open office, um, you know, it was it was interesting because, um, yeah, we kind of needed to teach people how to do peer reviews, uh, how to let others look at their work, and um, putting putting out code that wasn't complete because we were building we were doing developer releases and and they weren't complete. But every build that went out, the first couple of builds. There was absolutely nothing wrong. Like everything was fixed. Everyone was just hunkering down because it was their work that was being um, displayed. And nobody, um, you know, this, they, they were used to working on a product that they were releasing for end users. And um, we had an incident where this build, build 613. Um, was released, and suddenly um, it was broken. <laughs> it was broken, but what happened was 
Up until that point, the, the engineers were struggling um, to really get engagement from the community. We had, um, we just had, like people lurking. There were just a lot of lurkers. There was one um, guy who started working on the Linux PPC port, um, and he was a, a academic from Canada, and he was working on this port. But there were very few because the code base wasn't very modular. You know, there was engagement and porting and in localization. But the core part of the code was really, really hard to get into. And so many people just looking and watching. And then all of a sudden, with the 613 build, it went out. And there was this hive of activity going on in the mailing list. And the engineers were just mortified that they actually released something that was broken. And, um, but it was the best thing that could have happened to the community and to the project. So what happened was um, a lot of people got involved in the conversation, and um, we ended up uh, really kind of having a collaborative effort in fixing it. And there was a, there was a big lesson for, um, for both the Sun engineering teams that were active in the project, um, and the rest of the community to learn as well. So here, you know, perfectionism is not always your friend and leaves things for the community. And of course, we know that, you know, release early and often. Um, it doesn't have to be, um, it's, it's fine for it to go out with bugs because that's where you get a lot of engagement in the community. But these were hard lessons learned by teams that were releasing code. And it wasn't just the open office community. This was happening in many other projects. And you know, a lot of the time at the time there were a lot of companies that were pushing um, and releasing their code and making that available as open, open source. Um, nowadays with GitHub, um, a lot of the code already starts out as open source, but there are still instances where companies are releasing code and some of those lessons still need to be repeated so that people can actually learn from them. Now, um, this next story is about being the change. And, you know, whether it's an open source project or a program um, like Google Summer of Code or like Outreachy, um, you're working with people. I'm just checking time. Okay. Yeah, and um, we, you know, Linus is um, is known for saying. Many people are known for saying that really it's about the people. Um, the technology is the easy part of what we do. It's actually working with the people and getting that part of it right um, is the is the biggest challenge, right? So. Um, you get not just community, but you also get you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly that comes with it. And I think it's important. And from the very outset, you know, one of the things we did was show kindness to everybody that showed up and really understand and listen. Be transparent in what we were doing and show some compassion. Um, the other things we did was we displayed our uh, mission statement and our values very, very clearly. There were no codes of conduct back then. Now every site has one. You can just go grab one, put that in with your project. So these were all, these were all things that were developed as a result of some of these projects. And um, as well as you know, stating your mission very clearly. And that helped our project really a lot. Because you know, when people come into the community and they want to do something different, you can all go back to your uh, mission statement and say, hey, this is what we're about. That is not what we're about. And having that clarity really, really helped us. So these are two of my mentors, um, Brian Bellendorf and Greg Stein. Again, I mentioned them earlier from, um, they're both uh, part of the early Apache project. Um, Brian was instrumental in helping with open office. Um, from, from his work with Collabnet um, and Greg Stein as well. Um, the other person is um, Denise Cooper. And Denise was instrumental also at Sun, not just in mentoring 
me and our project, but in mentoring a lot of the Sun projects. And she was um, pretty key in um, really kind of the success of open source at Sun. There's a lot of innovation that happened in the community. And um, for example, um, we had a small team uh, in Hungary. And innovation happened on the fringes because the main core part of the code base really needed to be refactored and it needed to be much more modular. So that was the work that was going on while the, the rest of the community kind of like gathered around the fringes. And here, we had a small team in Hungary um, that fed pizza and Coke, Coca-Cola, <laughs> to students all weekend <laughs> for three days. And they translated the whole of the office suite into Hungarian office uh, by, you know, by the Sunday night. And actually, there was somebody from the Guinness World Records there who captured it. And they, they had an entry in the Guinness Book of Records for the fastest translation. Um, the other innovation was um, the, the downloads for OpenOffice just grew like crazy. You know, we started off with like tens of thousands. And before we knew it, we're into hundreds of thousands. And um, our sun budget was running out. So we were paying for Akamai servers and um, for the downloads. And because the money was running out, we didn't know what to do. We just didn't, hadn't factored that in. And we ended up asking the community um, if there was anyone who could help with this. And within literally um, you know, two months, two to three months, we had 45 mirror sites set up all over the world um, that helped us with our downloads. And really, the fact that we had um, little money for it um, wasn't really a problem. So there was a ton of innovation there. And then, um, see, innovation doesn't just happen on its own. You have to also set up an environment as well um, for the community to innovate. So in the early days, um, you know, we had a lot of pushback from the community that it wasn't so easy to engage. And one of the problems was a copyright agreement. And the Sun lawyers had written a copyright agreement that really required all the contributions to be assigned to Sun under this license. And um, there were a few community members in the early open office um, who took the time really to explain to us that this was a barrier to community engagement. So they were not happy about it. And of course, there were lots of heated conversations. Um, they wanted to really work collaboratively with us and explain, explain to Sun, explain to Sun lawyers, um, you know, why it didn't work for them. And especially in Europe, you know, there's something called moral rights, and you can't transfer your moral rights over to a company either. So this was a problem for European law as well. Um, you probably know this gentleman here, Josh Burkus. Um, so there was Josh. There was an Italian lawyer on the, in the community, Gianluca Tocconi, and, and someone in France, Guy Capra. And three of them, I remember, were really instrumental in helping us understand um, the importance of changing this. And Denise was also instrumental in this, in uh, working with our legal system in, t in Sun and making sure that we, um, we actually got the Sun lawyers to uh, work on this and, and not dismiss it. This was a key part of our success, right? So it took about a year to change. So you can imagine the conversations, the meetings, um, but we did change it. And we changed it to something called the Joint Copyright Agreement, which meant that the individual also retained all the rights, as well as providing those to the project. And yeah, it was quite, it was quite a job convincing Sun to change it. And, um, it wasn't just changed for OpenOffice, but it was also changed for all of Sun's projects, and everybody benefited. So just in the same way that some of these things, some of these um, uh, 
ways of working that have been um, tried and tested in these communities um, getting shared and getting shared at conferences like this. Um, they're the ones that actually help uh, you know, other projects and uh, on, a, on a much broader scale. So the lesson here you know, is really, it's about people and communication. It's about listening. That's a really big part of it. And really being open to change and you know, I was very blessed that we did have lawyers in Sun who were, who were open to change and the community that really had the patience to learn and help us fix this. And that's what really led to a lot of that innovation. So I had to put in trolls in here, but unfortunately, I'm going to disappoint you because we were very lucky as a community. Um, we had a lot of people who showed up in the community with a huge passion to help us and help us bring about change. Um, we don't recall any bad incidents. Yes, heated conversations, and there were, there were discussions, absolutely. You know, we formed a community council because the community wanted to have a bigger voice um, across everything. And typically, when you have a project that's released by a company, most of the developers tend to come from that corporation initially because they have that knowledge base. But over time, that should change. And it should change to have a much more inclusive voice. And so as part of the change, it requires some interesting conversations. See, one of the community members um, did fall out with a few people. And he had some ideas, and it wasn't around code, it was around documentation. And he wanted, um, he wanted to present the information in a very different way and um, attribute it in a very different way as well. And he fell out with some of the community members because they didn't understand what he was trying to do because it wasn't the way they had selected to do this. You know, there wasn't anything wrong with that. Um, but so... They kind of dismissed him. Maybe they thought he was a troll, and they just kind of dismissed him, and he went away. This is what typically happens in projects. If people ignore, if it's not something that's invented here, they ignore um, the individuals. And here what happened was he went away, and he built a website, and he demonstrated what he really wanted us to do. And then when I looked at it, and others looked at it, it just felt like, Yes, this is the kind of thing we should be doing within our community, but our current infrastructure did not allow it, and that was a limiting factor. Um, you know, the, the service that we had through CollabNet did not allow us to do that. And, um, but it was, it was a really great example of a community member going away and actually doing the work somewhere else, and he created this website called OOO Docs. And of course, there are people unhappy about that, but there was also an overwhelming support of, yeah, this is something we should be evolving to, to doing. Um, we knew that the infrastructure wasn't going to change at any time soon. So we provided links to that site. And we kind of embraced him and gave him access to a whole bunch of web pages. So he could, he could actually be a webmaster on the project as well. And... Um, it kind of ended up being a really positive result for the whole community. So again, you know, innovation doesn't always happen within the frame of what you know. It happens elsewhere. And this is a great quote from uh, Bill Joy. So, you know, let people help and um, understand if somebody is passionate and they're having a heated conversation, they care about what you're doing. And if they didn't care, they would just go away. So the, in this next tale, um, I'm going to present, um, I guess I had, I had depicted companies and benevolent dictators for life of projects um, as kind of the dragons. You know, they contribute code, um, they provide the sponsorship, which is much needed, they provide resources, um, they provide support, um, developers, lawyers, money, um, and it's a great ecosystem when all of this works well. 
And it's for the companies, it's really, and the BDFLs, it's a whole dance between control and support. And I don't know, I don't know how many of you work in large corporations here uh, releasing open source projects and, and have worked on open source projects um, where the code was contributed by a large company or a, by a BDFL. You kind of, um, it's a really, really fine balance, right? Um, so, for example, in, in um, OpenOffice, uh, we, had, we had Sun donated um, the code for the Mac port for OpenOffice to the community. And often what happens is um, the code is donated, and at some point, the developers are moved on to another project. And this happened with the Mac port. The six developers that are working on the OpenOffice Mac port um, were moved to another project. Now, um, we had one of the community engineers, um, developers, we had, we had an individual in the community who was um, proactively working on the Mac port once it was released, and um, he created something called NeoOffice. Um, I don't know whether any of you on, on the Mac have used that, but he added an additional clause um, to his contributions for NeoOffice, so he could take basically some financial donations to keep his work going. And um, that really freaked out the Sun lawyers. Um, they were trying to break, that he, they thought that he was trying to break open office and um, that it would re reflect really badly on them. Um, the press really loved the Mac port because most of the press were Mac users. And um, we got some really, really great reviews and write-ups because of that. But the company's reaction was really not to embrace this new office port. So, and meanwhile, um, the former lead for the macOS project, you know, the guy who was running this team of six developers, his heart was still in that Mac port, and even though he's moved to another project, he actually came, he actually left the company, and he joined the um, Ed, uh, who had actually created a new office, and he started working full-time with Ed on that project. So the company lost you know, a really, really good developer. Now, um, it's, it's, a, it's a symbiotic relationship between the organization um, and living as part of that community. And it was in this story, um, it kind of shows that, the, that basically you can take your skills, you can take your talents and choose to go to the projects and the work that you want to do. Um, you know, it's companies are starting to realize they can't just move open source developers off of a project um, onto another one because, you know, that project kind of lives on. Um, and the control and support, uh, there were a lot of lessons learned by corporations and, and still do. And I think as we have more and more enterprises participating in open source and releasing their code as well, there's a lot of lessons here to learn um, in actually letting go. When you're releasing it to the community, provide the support, but the whole need for control, um, companies are going to find that the, the earlier they let go, um, the more rewarding it will be as well as, as a community relationship. Okay, so um, the next story is on superpowers. Now, you've worked with others that have excelled with superpowers, and you see them. You see them in your community, right? Um, and so what are your superpowers? You know, um, maybe some of these. I don't know. <laughs> but in reality, right? You're just brilliant at what you do, as whether you're a coder, whether you're a creator, whether you're a leader, um, you know, whether you're 
great at curating and collecting people. Um, you may be a good listener. You may be great in your community as a mediator when issues come up. And that may be the best time, that's when you really shine. Um, you may be the warm, friendly person who greets everybody, and that is your superpower. But you all have superpowers, and it's important not just to recognize your own, but to recognize that in other people. So, you know, we looked at the giants, some of the giants earlier, and, um, you know, look at the people in your community that you feel are the ones that are um, the, the leaders, that are the giants, and why, why what you're doing is successful, and what can you learn from them? Because the one thing, or oh, open source affords a lot of great uh, input into our careers, but also it's learning from your peer network. And if you're working in a company, you're not going to have um, necessarily the people with the same skills that you look up to as you will in your community as well. So, you know, how can you learn from others in the community? Um, and the other thing that's really important, and I think really important for um, the, I guess, the kind of generation of um, developers and uh, community members that are coming into the projects is that it's actually really, really hard work. We have um, all been doing this work for a long time, and it's not something that um, you can transform overnight. Like People want to come into a community, and um, it's like six months' work. No, we've been doing this for you know, 10, 20 years, and some of these projects have as well. So recognizing that it's not something that you can just kind of speed through, and it's an important, um, it's an important lesson for companies as well. So here, like, um, yeah, everyone's got superpowers, and um, you know, none of anything that's been accomplished in open source um, has happened with speed. Okay. I just wanted to leave this page intentionally blank, just to pause. So the last story is um, on the reward. Why, why do we all um, working in open source? And I think everyone has a different reason for um, contributing and participating. Um, so the open office story here is that, um, you know, as I said earlier, natural gravitation towards languages um, in the community just because, you know, it was something that would sit on everybody's machine and um, it could be used globally by a large consumer base. So you know, typically with an office productivity suite or something like a um, browser or some of the kind of the basic um, software you need on a machine, um, to run your, like your operating system as well. And back then, GNOME was very actively involved in this work. But um, with languages, typically, a company will only translate into maybe 25 languages maximum, any, any kind of users, any user software. And um, that was a big problem, because when you look at India, India alone has 200 languages. So we look at how many people are not getting the opportunity to work with technology. And the barrier to learn English is way, way bigger than um, the barrier to actually learn technology. Um, and that was a huge insight I had at a, at a conference. Actually, it was at the COPA conference um, when I had somebody from Cambodia saying, you know, our, our, in our country, people can't actually do very much with technology because there's such a big part of the population that just doesn't speak English. So um, LibreOffice um, was translated. OpenOffice and LibreOffice um, now is available in over 100 languages. And um, we really supported the language community, and we had this thriving, uh, engaging group doing translation. So that's my father on the screen. He's 87 this year. 
And he came from a village in India in Gujarat. And um, he really understood the value of education. Uh, over 25 years, um, he raised enough funds to buy some land. Um, a group of them had a high school built and then a junior school. And um, now there are over 1,500 kids that go to that school that would not have had an education um, because the schools were too far away. And for most parents in the villages, it really wasn't important to send their kids because they wanted them to work in the fields. It really wasn't important to send them to school. So um, I, um, so my, 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 my folks are from um, the Gujarat, both my parents. And um, with open office, uh, I was given a um, CD of open office in Gujarati, which I actually took to the school and installed on their donated computers so that the kids and the teachers could actually start to learn um, and use the technology um, and use the computers ahead of um, learning English really well. Um, and, you know, for me, it was a really huge reward to be able to be in service and support the education of the school and, and support the work that my dad was doing. And these are the kinds of moments that matter to me um, in the work that we do. Now, there was this kid um, who did that translation in open office, and he and I got to know each other over the years, and especially because he mentioned I kind of looked up Gujarati and he was doing the work, so we connected. And he did the work for Firefox, he did the work for many other applications as well. And the, the really cool story here is that um, he got, through his work in OpenOffice and through his reference, um, he is now, um, he did his uh, engineering degree and because everyone could also see his work, um, he was hired as a release engineer for Wikimedia Foundation. And it's the kind of opportunity, like he was in this small college in this remote village in India. And it's a kind of opportunities that these kids like really only just dream about. So open office is not only just um, and the work has helped, you know, improve kind of the technology skills of people all over the world. So when I travel from Nepal in the south of India to, um, sorry, in the north of India um, to Tamil, um, which is spoken in the south, um, I've been given off open office translations or CDs um, back in the day <laughs> um, for all of these languages and in Africa as well. So um, we really, as a community doing open source, have um, engaged a very kind of large global force out there that is passionate. Um, we may not see this in the US, but as you travel the world, you really start to see how much support and engagement um, there is for the work that we're all doing. And so, you know, the rewards might be that you just love being in your community and you love the work you do, the people that you work with. But a lot of the TED Talks that I've watched, when they talk about, like, humanity and what is it we want to, um, what is our purpose, what, we, what really sparks us, um, a lot of it goes back to belonging and connecting to people that are... Um, share your passions and um, that, you, that you actually um, collaborate with and uh, enjoy. It's a big part of learning as well, which sparks people, or in my case, it's also the being in service. And the bonus for this kid and so many, I mean, there are just um, so many stories of people that have got careers in open source or careers in technology because of the voluntary work or the work they did in open source. So it really is your reference and the community is your reference. So I want you to kind of leave you with a couple of things to think about. One is, you know, what are your superpowers and how do you use them? What are your stories? 
and I'd really like you to share them. Uh, I am Zahida B on Twitter, Zahida B Amazon. I'd love to hear them. Our work isn't done. You know, we have much more to do, and it's not the end. I'd like um, a few acknowledgements here for the folks that have contributed to the storytelling and the book. Oops. Yeah, so those are my, that's my information if you want to connect with me. I'd love to hear more from this community as well. And one of my coworkers is speaking right after this, so um, I said that I would give her a quick plug. Thank you. I don't have, um, I don't think we've got much time for questions. Yeah, no, okay. no, no problem. Cool, so thanks everybody for, for joining us this morning. Uh, Zahida, as is our, as our custom, we'd like to welcome you to the Scale family yeah. with a uh, personalized cool. jersey. Cool, thank you everyone. Thanks for joining <laughs> us and being part of the team. Um, again, a couple, just a couple quick updates. As I mentioned, uh, well, as Zahida mentioned, uh, Deirdre will be speaking in, in uh, room 103 at 11.30 about marketing your open source projects. Um, Again, Ty, Ty Shipman, who is going to be speaking about uh, credentials and passwords and access control after death, uh, has uh, unfortunately un is unable to join us. Uh, but Kyle Rankin has graciously joined, graciously volunteered to give his uh, sex, uh, sex god and um, passwords, uh, his, his brief history of bad passwords at 11:30. It's a longer version of his upscale talk that was that was given last night. So he'll be in room um, room 106. Uh, other than that, uh, please don't forget to pick up your scale t-shirts on the expo floor. There's uh, still quite a few of them in booth 431. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you throughout the rest of the day. Thanks for joining us at scale and see you in uh, 20, 2019.